So most of you in the audience tonight are reaching the age where it's time to get serious about your lives, where you're supposed to put the hard work in to make something of yourself. And I think that's very important. It's, it's incredibly necessary to have discipline in life. But as you stand on the cusp of adulthood, I want to say a word for play. And we're going to look at a little video here. Where is it? Oh, there we go. So that's what I do, um, and we tend to think of play as being something frivolous or whimsical in our culture, but I think that we need to reconceptualize play. We need to understand that play is actually one of our most powerful drives and what's one of the most powerful means that we have available to us to become the people that we want to become. So I come from the movement industry and from the fitness industry, and the biggest problem that we have in those industries is that people just aren't motivated to do it. Right? Everybody knows that you're supposed to exercise. Everybody wants to be healthy. Everybody wants to look good. And yet, for some reason, most people can't seem to stop arguing on Twitter, stop playing Call of Duty, put down the Cheetos and actually go outside or get to the gym. So why is that? I think it's because fundamentally, we've misunderstood the most powerful drive to get us moving. And that drive is the play drive. So imagine a a small child, right? They will go find a, a hill to slide down over and over again, right? As they do that, of course, they're exercising intensely, but they don't think about it like that. They think about it as fun. And unfortunately, we don't think about it as exercise either because we've come up with this strange idea that, that in order for something to be useful, it kind of has to be boring and drudgerous. But actually, what we find is when we look at play, play is one of our most powerful means of learning. Um, okay. Uh, so play is something that is a motivational drive. It's a, it's a force that you can use, and it's a guide to who you can become and a model for, for how you can build yourself. Within um, my own work in movement, we've seen... Uh, I've seen this over and over again. This is the heart of what I do. I get people to start playing, and I've seen the same thing in parkour. So I've been in the parkour community for 13 years, and I've watched it grow from about a few hundred people worldwide to probably over millions of people now. And what I've seen is, in 13 years, we've seen this incredible growth in skill, and the people who've gone out and done parkour, they've become courageous and competent and really integrated people in a broad way. Because what they've done is they've essentially rediscovered the power of their play drive and they've applied it to the urban environment. So what does play actually do? Why do we play? Well, play um, builds your brain. Play is actually one of your most powerful learning systems. When we are playing, our learning system, or our capacity to learn increases by something like 500%. Um, when we play, our mood increases, uh, stress decreases, we increase our capacity for concentration and persistence. So play is this incredible, powerful medicine for our minds. And more than that, it's actually a means by which we socialize. So Jacques Pongsep, who I mentioned earlier, he discovered that there's a play drive in the, in the mammal brain. It's something very specific. It's not the same thing as motivation to eat. It's not the same thing as motivation for love or motivation for dominance. We're motivated to play. And if you look at little rats that are denied play, they're as motivated to get in a, and get a chance to play. As, the, as if you starve a rat and look at its motivation to go and eat. So why are we so driven to play? Research in um, monkey models actually shows that we're so driven to play 
that we um, that, that we'll play even when it's at a cost to our growth. So what is play doing? Well, socially, what play is doing is it's teaching us how to negotiate and communicate with each other. It's teaching us where our body is and where another thing's body is, how to deal with pain, deal with stress, deal with conflict. So if you want to be effective socially, if you want to make friends easily, if you want to be effective in your career, if you want to be effectively assertive and also empathic, play is actually your primary learning grounds for this. So every species actually plays in its own way, too. You guys have all seen dogs. Dogs love to chase and play tag and play games of tug of war and pull things down and, eat, uh, and tear them apart because that's how wolves catch their prey. Similarly, if you watch a cat, cats love to stalk and pounce and grapple and bite because that's how cats have evolved to make their living in the world. Human beings also have a species-specific form of play, and if you look at every culture in the world, you'll find that we also love to play games of tag and chase. We are also pursuit predators. We also love to play hide and seek and ambush each other. Like cats, we ambush our prey. And we're also prey animals, so we need to hide, and we need to be able to run away. And we climb trees. Um, Human beings are primates. Primates have been in the trees for 90 million years. You have binocular vision and grasping hands and any number of other features because they evolved first in the trees. So when we look at play, what we're actually seeing is a guideline to how you can best move in order to become the best version of yourself as a human being. But a human being is a very interesting thing because human beings play in very diverse ways. So some of you guys may love, say, long distance running. That was a really important aspect of our evolved movement too. But some of you may hate it. Personally, I found it pretty miserable until pretty recently in my life. Um, likewise, some of you guys may love team sports and some of you may prefer solo activities. Well, the thing about human beings that makes us really unique is that we share and we collaborate. For the most part, other animals don't share food. Like wolves work together to take down a prey, but then they try to wolf as much of the food down as possible and try to guard it from all the other wolves. Chimpanzees will share with their young, the, the females, and you know, lots of animals will share with the young, but for the most part, they don't share between peers. But human beings do. If you take down a bison, you share it with everyone in the tribe. And because of that, we actually benefit from temperamental variations in our personalities, right? It's good for you, it's good for me, if you and I don't have the same strengths. Because then, as a super organism, as a group of animals, we're stronger. So some of you guys may be very risk tolerant. Some of you guys may be more risk averse. That's actually something that helps the whole tribe because somebody needs to be the guy who's gonna jump off the cliff and somebody needs to be the person who's gonna say, hey, this is dangerous, let's not do this. And this tells you something about the type of life that you're gonna thrive best in because the type of person who loves to jump off a cliff is someone who's high in risk tolerance. And risk tolerance is critical if you wanna be, for instance, an entrepreneur. It's also critical if you want to be an artist. You have to take a lot of risks if you're an athlete or an artist to make uh, success in your career. So you need some risk tolerance. On the other hand, some of you guys may enjoy putting things together in a very specific way, in a very orderly way. And that's actually a measure of your conscientiousness. People who are really orderly and like to put things in place are people who are going to do well in accounting and management. Or if you like to take things apart and put them back together, you're going to find that you do well as an engineer. So, the way that you play is actually a way to motivate yourself. It's a way to understand your own personality. And it's a way to integrate the different aspects of your personality. Think of life as a big game. It's filled with many little micro games that you can play. And in each game, there's times when it's going to be fun and playful and easy. And there are times when it's going to be hard and you're going to have to grind and you're going to have to have grit. You're going to have to have discipline. But go back to that little kid climbing the hill, right? If you don't have discipline, then you don't get to climb the hill. You're not gonna drag your inner tubes back to the top, and so you don't get to go down the slip and slide. If you're not willing to work hard, you don't get to play the best games. But there's a flip side to that, which is that if all you ever do is grind and grind and grind, if you're always disciplined, if you're always pushing, and you never take the time to slide back down the hill, if you never let play lead and motivate you, you're gonna end up 20 years into your career completely burned out. You're gonna have maybe success, you're gonna have power, you're gonna have prestige, you're gonna have money, the nice car, whatever it is, but you're gonna feel hollow inside. 
because you never discovered the aspects of yourself that you're most passionate about. You never found your own inner drives. You want to set yourself up so that you're engaging the things that are rewarding to you, not just the people around you. So the thing about play is that it's intrinsically motivating. You will do it whether you get a good grade or you get no grade. You'll do it whether you get paid or you don't get paid. You'll do it whether you get a gold star or not. And if we go back to the model of the, the little rats who didn't get a chance to play, unfortunately, we live in a culture where kind of all of us are experiencing that. We take kids at five years old and put them in seats for six hours a day. And they don't get a full chance to play. So it's easy in our lives to not connect with your own deepest motivations. And I think that's a big reason why we have epidemics of anxiety and depression in the modern era, because people don't know how to play. So the great thing is as you guys age, you grow up and you get a chance to build the own, your own game of life, right? You get to design the game for yourself. And as you do, I would suggest that you build a game that incorporates your own drive to play, right? When we are playing, we are at our most inspired. We are at our most creative. So design a game that works for you. So study the way that you play as an individual. Right? In my own life, um, the way that I'm trying to set myself up is I love to train. I love to move. Right? I want to jump and climb and flip. I love to teach and train and work with people, and I love to share my ideas with people. So if I understand that about myself, then I know something about the type of life that I want to live. So define your winning conditions, right? Figure out what a great life looks like to you. Do you need to make a lot of money or are you happier with less? Are you someone who, who's very passionate about traveling the world or are you somebody who really loves to stay home and cultivate something deeply? Are you somebody who likes to work um, with others or are you somebody who likes to work solo? All those can, you can discover through, through playing games and then figure out who you are and what game you're going to thrive in. So define your winning conditions. Once you're there, what you want to do is use your passions to motivate you. So we all have to go through the hard parts in our life. What you want to do is keep in mind that the things that you care about in your profession, in your life, are the rewards for the work that you have to do. Next, what you want to do, don't forget your play, sorry, um, is you want to find strategies to stack your time. You want to find strategies where more and more of the time that you spend is spent on doing the things that are intrinsically rewarding for you. The ultimate win, the best game to play, is the game where everything that you do for money is something that you would choose to do for fun. In my own life, I, uh, my biggest need maybe is to market and to administrate my business. So within marketing, you know, I could go and I could study lots of different marketing mechanisms, but to be honest, my eyes kind of glaze over when I have to read about cost per click and uh, advanced behavioral targeting. But what I love to do is I love to move. So when I make a, a video and share it with people, that's marketing. When I write an essay on something that's deep, that I'm deeply passionate about, that's also content marketing. So the more that I can leverage the things that I'm passionate about to achieve the things that I need, the better the game that I get to play is. The more fun I have and actually the more productive I am. So remember these, these, these ideas. If you can define your life this way, if you can take play seriously and set yourself up to play a game that's deeply meaningful to you, you're going to be far more productive in the long run and you're going to have so much more fun doing it. Thank you guys.